So in South Africa, we are in the thick of COVID-19. Cases are rising and a lot more people are starting to get it, which is kind of um, reducing the stigma attached, that fear factor for a lot of people of catching COVID-19. Um, I'm going to chat to a few people today who have had it and also bring in exercise scientist or physiologist Zach Van Heerden just to get a bit more of a physiological understanding of, of what it is or what it means to sort of catch something like COVID and what it may do to your your body. But first up, I'm speaking to Mark Wolf, the fitness freak. Um, Mark, uh, welcome on to the show. Glad to see you looking a bit better. I know you've been battling with it for the last week or so. Yeah, I'm on day 11 now. Um, and uh, I think I've really turned a corner. I'm feeling amazing today compared to the last 10 days. That's for sure. Talk to me about, um, you know, basically just how you came in contact. I know you, you put something down on, on, on Instagram. Obviously, we've all been trying to be as careful as we can, but it is a very contagious virus, so easy to pick up. And then what are the first symptoms you sort of started showing that made you think I might have caught it? Well, I mean, first off, I've got to say that uh, we were in isolation completely since lockdown. And uh, as much as people want to get out there and be social, I mean, I, I didn't want to even catch it. So. Uh, the focus was actually staying isolated as much as possible. You even know that I refused to even go to the office. <laughs> so um, I, I think that the, the thing is, is that I don't think you want to catch it in the early stages. I think Zach mentioned that as well, because um, there's too much unknown. In later stages, obviously, there'll be a lot more known about it. But um, another thing is, is I've got very frail parents uh, with underlying conditions and COVID could be a death sentence to them. And I think that was the, the primary objective was to avoid them at all costs. But uh, after we moved to stage three, um, you know how parents can be, mother hasn't seen the son for a while, et cetera, et cetera, I need to see you, I want to see you. And eventually after much debate and deliberation, I had in, uh, had them over for a lunch and um, uh, lo and behold, uh, my mother was actually an asymptomatic carrier. Uh, when I say asymptomatic, no flu symptoms presented at all, absolutely nothing. She's a Crohn's disease sufferer. Um, her bowel's actually been removed, so it's, it's not a pretty situation for her. Um, she just told me she felt feeling a little bit of fatigue. Um, I hadn't seen my brother in many months, but I heard that him, his wife, and their three children had all tested positive for COVID. And then I realized that the only person they'd been in contact with was my mother, who had been in contact with me. I didn't think much of it um, until I think the last week, Monday night, Tuesday morning, I started to feel a little bit flat. Um, it's the same as if a flu symptoms are going to come. You know, you feel that slight fatigue beforehand. I did a two hour training session in the morning, got off the bike, and I was like, mm, not feeling 100% great. Um, and then it moved into a sort of dry, scratchy throat, um, which is typical of sinus. Actually, the onset of a sinus, slight post-nasal throat irritation. I did feel a bit of sinus pressure. I'm thinking, oh, well, there's sinus infection. For people that are used to sinus infections, this felt absolutely normal. And they decided to treat their sinus. Um, and then I found out that my brother had tested positive and... Um, once I realized that uh, he had tested positive, I realized, oh, okay, these symptoms might be manifesting into something else. The throat got very, very bad from a dry and painful point of view. Uh, still dryness. Um, and then after that, severe headache started to set in. Um, you know, again, some more congestion, head congestion, sinus congestion, I think. Uh, uh, my wife landed up with severe earache. Um, her ear was congested quite badly, a lot of pressure build up. And then I decided once I heard that uh, they, they tested positive. I actually just got on the doctor and went for a test. Um, went for the test and it takes about 72 hours, got it back and lo and behold, I was positive. Uh, the symptoms tend to sort of worsen over time. And then suddenly you feel better and you think, okay, it's not so bad, it's over. And then it takes a completely different turn and it hits you in a completely different area. And that was when it moved from the head uh, into the chest and into the body. Uh, and then I went backwards again. Um, but at no point did I ever really worry, et cetera, because it's, you know, it's just, you just got to go with the flow and focus on the right things and doing the right things. I think that's the most important thing, you know, looking after your body. One thing I have to stress is that from the day we went into lockdown, I started to prime my immune system for a potential infection later on. I knew that eventually we're probably all going to get it. 
and my complete focus switched to health and to immunity. I focused on making sure that I get at least eight hours sleep a night. I think my average over lockdown is actually closer to eight hours, 50 minutes a night. I've measured, I've been monitoring my sleep over the last 16 years. This was the, the, the most I've ever slept. Um, I focused very much on making sure that I didn't overtrain, um, that my nutrition was absolutely spot on. I was fortifying my nutrition as well, making sure that I wasn't in too much of a calorie deficit, um, that I was eating quite healthily. Obviously taking the right vitamins and minerals, drinking plenty of fluids, so that if I did end up getting an infection, whether it's a cold or flu or even COVID, uh, the body's got the ability to fight it all. And I think that that's where everybody's focus should, should focus on actually just getting your immune system up to scratch. I know a lot of people have spent time during lockdown going absolutely mad with the training. And maybe to some people it looks like I'm going mad, but, but not necessarily. I mean, most of my training is actually zone one, zone two. I do do my intensity sessions here and there. But uh, overall, I think the whole focus for me has really been about health and fortifying the immune system. Because that's really the only way you can, can fight up an illness. So I think that's uh, essentially what a lot of uh, professionals have said from the start, you know, boost your immune system, allow your body to have those, those mechanisms in place to fight off the infection when you get it, because most of us are going to get this, whether we get it early, uh, somewhere in the middle, like you're starting to get, or late on, it, it's going to go around, it's going to mutate. But I think we'll ch I'll chat a bit more about that science with Zach. What I want to ask you is when you were sick and you knew you were sick, I presume then all training was off. I mean, yes, you weren't feeling well, but that is not a time to think you need to maintain fitness. No, um, and I can tell athletes, acceptance is the first port of call. When you're sick or you're injured, you need to immediately accept it. You need to immediately change your entire mindset around training needs to be pushed aside. My focus is now fighting an illness. Um, and, and that's exactly how I shifted. Immediately, my calorie intake dropped significantly, obviously. Um, I dropped it down to uh, just below what my rest metabolic rate would be, so I'm in a slight deficit. Um, immediately fat percentage drops down, um, carbohydrates, especially in the form of sugars, drop down significantly. Uh, I boost my vegetable intake, obviously more high fiber fruits um, and, and high fiber vegetables. Um, I uh, increased my fluid intake. Um, in actual fact, I didn't just drink water to maximize fluid absorption. I used like a, a 32 gel hydrate, a hydration fluid to try and make sure that I maximize that fluid absorption. Um, I started increasing my zinc dosage. Uh, I take elderberry extract. Um, I've always been taking vitamin D. I monitor my bloods every three to four months. So I, I actually understand the levels of my bloods all the time. And I, 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 I do what's called dosing um, according to what those levels, what, what I want those levels to be. Um, I take 5,000 IU of vitamin D a day. Um, I increase my vitamin C intake slightly. I've always taken vitamin C purely because, I, because I'm more of a plant-based eater. Um, I do have to worry about my iron, so I take that to help with the iron absorption. I do take iron tablets. And um, over and above that, um, you know, just uh, eating the right foods. Um, I think that that's the most uh, critical thing. Um, it's very strange now because, you know, usually I'm eating six to seven meals a day. And suddenly I'm dropping down to maybe three meals a day, maybe with one snack, so maybe three in a snack, etc. It's, it's a complete shift, but you have to do it. You can't carry on as if things are normal. And the most important thing is actually bed rest, because the only time your body is going to fight up an infection is when you're actually uh, resting completely. Obviously, you also have to monitor the symptoms. I was in communication with a physician who's excellent. Um, and uh, she did guide us a little bit on, on how we should be treating it. Um, we do know it's a vascular disease. So as I mentioned in my previous video, uh, we're taking the Ectrin as a, which is an aspirin, as a, an anticoagulant or a blood thinner, just as a preventative measure, which is harmless. Um, over and above that, um, no vasoconstrictors, where you would normally try and use a decongestant. We actually moved move away from that completely because you want to keep that vascular system open. You don't want to risk any clotting. And, um, I think that that's the biggest danger is, is I've heard people have got colds and flu and they tell me that they've gone to the doctor or they've started themselves on a course of antibiotic and I'm thinking that is the craziest thing ever. How can you take an antibiotic when there's a virus running around? You know, an antibiotic kills all the good guys as well. You're actually weakening your own military forces inside your body to fight off an infection. 
And I think it is so irresponsible to just jump onto a treatment plan without actually thinking that this could be a viral infection or something worse. You know, when I lived overseas, in some countries, doctors would lose their licenses for prescribing antibiotics without actually having a, a, a throat swab done to test for positive bacterial infection. Um, they're very anti in some countries. But don't think that this is a flu. Don't think that it's a cold. There is a pandemic at the moment, which is a virus running around infecting people. And you need to have in the back of the mind that if this is a viral infection, it is not treated the same way as a bacterial infection. You can't just jump to that. So for viral infections, there's really not much you can really do. Your body is really ultimately the, the machine that has to fight it all. And, and the only way to do that is nutrition, bed rest, stop training, and you, know, you just need to accept it and let the body fight. Well, Mark, that's some brilliant advice. Glad to hear you feeling better. And just thanks for alleviating that sort of stigma and that fear that a lot of people have. I think there's a lot that people can learn from there. I'm also going to speak to, as I said, Zach Van Heerden a little bit later, but let's go to uh, Salumi Kuerpa, uh, two-time Comrades Marathon gold medalist, one of the very first people to sort of catch it or know that I know that have caught it in this country. So it'd be interesting to hear what the process was like for her. I, I went for an a, a innocent Sunday lunch with at old people's house i've literally just spent an hour there and i came back home um the the lady is a nurse in um she's working in a hospital and the the tuesday night was ready for bed and my friend sent me a message and she said listen my mother-in-law tested positive um and that's that's where i was on the sunday and I didn't think a lot of it because I was okay. And, but I informed everybody that I was in contact with the previous day and said, listen, I was in contact with somebody um, just, you know, just for curiosity and respect for other people. Um, I informed my employer as well, and I carried on as normal. But on the Monday, I saw a customer and the customer was quite upset and, and, and you know, they wanted to follow the correct procedures. And the only reason I went for the test was because I was forced to go for the test on the Friday. I was quite confident that I didn't have it. You know, I just did it because this is procedure and I have to do it. Um, Saturday night, nine o'clock, I was lying in bed ready to go and sleep and I got an SMS and it was from Ampen and I read it and it was a long message and I just saw um, you've, 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 got, you've got the virus, you tested positive and I, and I was sleepy and I thought maybe I didn't see right. So the Sunday morning I read it and I think I read that message like 50 times. Maybe you know I thought I misunderstood this so it came as a huge shock. It was, I felt emotional because now I'm supposed to be sick, but I don't really feel sick. And maybe they made a mistake, but um, the swap was taken from my nose and my throat, which, which is very accurate. Um, the nose is the first, the primary place where the, the um, virus will be picked up and then the throat is your secondary place. And the swap was taken from my nose and my throat. So. I knew that this, I knew that this was right, although it didn't feel right. Um, so yeah, it it was a huge shock. I read that message like for three, four days just to make sure I didn't misunderstand. Um, then um, the the government, you know, I I was now part of the statistics. Um, on the Tuesday, I had a call from the um, health department from government and and then I realized this is serious you know they they know where you are they ask you all these questions and they're checking on you you know they um, you know they will just drive past your house to make sure that you are at home and I felt like an inmate you know it felt like I did something wrong and they're checking on me so the for me it was a more it was more mentally damaging than what it was on a physical side. What sort of symptoms did, did you land up having and how much did that affect sort of your everyday life? I mean, now, of course, you were faced on the point that you need to stay put again, but, you know, were you going back to doing strength training? What were the recommendations from your doctor? 
Well, the recommendations from my doctor was just to, I had to isolate myself and stay at home. The only symptoms I had was slight headache. So I would wake up with, with, with a headache. Um, my, I couldn't taste my food. And there were one or two nights that I, that I had a fever. But that was, that was it. Um, from going from, from training and all of a sudden be isolated, it was worse than being in lockdown five because in lockdown five, I could still go to the shops and now I can't even do that. So what I did was um, I took my heart rate every morning, you know, with, with the, the Sunta watches we got from them, you know, with the wrist where they take your pulse. And I took my heart rate every morning and it was low. My, my heart rate was like 45. So I stayed in touch with my uh, coach all the time and I decided, you know, I don't feel sick. I'm going to run. So I ran odd hours where I didn't, I wasn't close to anybody else. I would run like when it was still dark in the mornings or very late in the afternoons. And I could still manage, I could still manage training. I went out for a run every single day. Um, I still did like a 20k run on, on a weekend. And uh, I, I was okay. I, I felt okay. So you managed to keep training. Um, as you said, you had minor symptoms and, you know, at the moment then what, have you just carried on picking it up? Have you not felt any sort of um, adverse sort of post reactions? Has, has, have you been sort of normal as, as if you've had a normal cold? Yes, not, not even. Uh, when, when I get a cold, I, I, I'm more sick than what I was now. Um, so I just kept on doing what I had to do. Uh, I trained um, and, and I was okay. Um, Afterwards, no symptoms, nothing. Um, and I've realized that if, the, if, you, if you are healthy and you fit, then this is not that bad. You know, it's mentally, mentally people, you know, so I had a lot of dear friends that contacted me every day to see how I was doing. And sometimes I felt that my symptoms wasn't enough. I should feel sicker than what I really did. But I, I was okay. I, I really felt okay. Um, it was like, it was just the headaches, tasteless of food. Um, thought of, I thought I lost my cooking skills, but it wasn't that. It was just part of the symptoms. But that was, that was it. Um, after my 14 days isolation, I started training again with my training partner. And, and that was it. So I think um, I think people are more more scared and they don't know what to expect because that's what it is. You you, you really don't know what to expect. You waiting you you sit and wait to get very very sick and it's not necessarily going to happen. You might not get very sick if you take your nutrition every day and and if you are healthy and you took care of your body over the years, then then you will be fine if you get this virus. Zach, I've chatted to Salumi Cooper, who um, caught you know, COVID-19 or coronavirus, whatever you want to call it, in the early stages. Nice office, by the way. I like your, mm, your COVID-19 office space. Um, We're a lockdown office. <laughs> uh, Mark Wolf has, has landed up getting it as well. It's, it's becoming quite rife in South Africa as we've sort of opened up. So these are very active people. These are endurance people who are used to being active all the time. And, you know, from chatting to Salumi, you know, the symptoms weren't that bad in her and she's relied in what her doctor said and Mark as well. What is the general practice for someone who sort of thinks they've got it or they, they've just caught it? Let's go back. Like, you know, you don't know, you think you have symptoms. Maybe they're not really advanced yet, but what should your initial response be from a physiological point of view in terms of exercise? Uh, look, I think it's always uh, safe rather than sorry. So you, know, you, you may have it, you might not have it. It's very difficult to tell, particularly during winter. There are other bugs floating around as well. So your regular flus, the other coronaviruses, of which there are four or five of those as well, which we pick up pretty much every year. Um, obviously, you, you may have symptoms. So if you suspect that you, um, that you have a, a COVID infection, a COVID-19 infection, the best thing to do is to seek medical assistance. Now, it doesn't mean you need to go anywhere, but pick up the phone. And there's a lot of... Lot of uh, hotlines and call centers and apps and all kinds of things available just to sort of take you through the process of determining whether or not you are candid, candidate for COVID-19 infection. And uh, I think that the biggest thing is, have you been exposed to somebody who, who has it? And I think, you know, in, in many cases you would know, you know, those people tend to be tested 
And uh, with the contact and tracing system, they can hold you. So listen, um, go positive, just be aware and that you, you could have been infected. If you then start to develop symptoms, then obviously it is a possibility. So you then you take the appropriate steps in terms of getting tested so you know what you're dealing with. Um, and But during that, that period between not knowing and maybe knowing and you know, so final confirmation. And um, the thing is with this, this COVID, those new coronaviruses, we don't know what it does. So um, it's not wise to train while you are in that sort of limo, because you don't know what you're doing to yourself. Now there's a lot of um, literature out there saying it's important to keep healthy. It's important to keep your physical fitness up and all that kind of thing, but not necessarily during an infective phase uh, like, like you might have. So the best thing to do is just put your feet up, keep yourself warm, keep yourself healthy, make sure you eat properly, make sure you rest properly like you do with any other bug that you might have um, until such time that you're in condition to train. Um, it's, it's very difficult because some people are completely asymptomatic. And I have you know, a, a few anecdotal examples of people who go out there and didn't know they had coronavirus until they went out and trained and then had a bit of a strange reaction um, the symptoms then exacerbated because of that of the training um, and then they tested positive thereafter. So, I mean, the biggest thing is just, if you're not sure, then there's, there's no point in training because what training does is it depresses the immune system and it can give um, this virus an opportunity then to spread and cause more problems. So, I mean, you touched on a good point there, treating it like you would sort of any other major illness um, or, or sort of virus. Why is there such a stigma then attached to it? Yes, we've seen the numbers and, and there are death rates, um, which is terrible to see and there is a risk. But what, what is the stigma? Is it, you know, you not to put someone else at risk? If you generally think you're healthy and you're active, you know, are these people showing sort of less severe symptoms or is it just there's just too much out there or not enough to tell? Well, the reality is it's a novel coronavirus or novel virus is new. We don't, we don't know much about it, to be honest. Um, we, we learn new things every day. So, I mean, that's the, that's the sort of gray area we're playing with. It's, we, it's, not a, it's not a flu. It's not the influenza, A or B. It's not swine flu. It's not the regular coronavirus. It's very similar to the previous SARS uh, epidemics of the, the early 2000s. But even then, the, the, the research and the, and the findings from those days don't necessarily apply. So, big issue, we, we don't know what we're dealing with. So, if you don't know what you're dealing with, then don't take unnecessary risks. So we don't know what this virus does. We don't know what tissues it actually attacks. And um, we've got a bit of an idea. We know obviously the respiratory system is affected. And um, we know now that the blood is affected. And those are two critical components for, for exercising adults particularly. So no point putting those, those systems under more stress. We don't know what it does to the heart. We don't know what it does to the liver. We don't know what it does to the kidney. And does the combination of this virus, when I say this particular virus, and exercise cause complications we don't yet know about? Why take that risk? And, you know, like I said, with any virus, it doesn't, doesn't matter what it is. You, the best thing that you can do is when, when you are infected with something and you have symptoms, stop training. You're not, you're not helping anybody, including yourself, by, by training with a, a viral infection. Um, the increase of, uh, of spread is, is greater, like you said, um, particularly not, not so much outdoors, but it dissipates, but the reality is you, you're breathing at a high rate, you're expelling more aerosol from your lungs and your respiratory passages, you, there is that potential to infect more people. That's why, why gyms are closed and training centers are closed and why there is social distancing, you know, try, trying to avoid that scenario. And um, you also then spread that viral load all over yourself. So now it's all over your clothes, all over your face, all over your mask, <laughs> inside the mask, on the gloves, et cetera, that kind of thing. Now you bring it all home and you spread it around your house and obviously um, that can then spread to your family members or other people in contact with you. And in terms of the stigma, the, the stigma is it's, 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 it's a lot of panic and a lot of fear. And it is justified because the thing is we don't know what this virus does. And it's clear that it is, is causing uh, massive complications in certain segments of the population, particularly people with comorbidities and um, older adults and people who are not particularly physically well, and not particularly physically fit. They tend to be at more risk, but there's no guarantee. Just because you're fit and young and healthy doesn't mean this virus can't touch you in some way and, and cause some serious complications. We don't know how it works. Um, there could be a genetic component. So you might be very, very fit and very, very healthy, but the, your genetics predispose you to a particular issue. So it's just not, not worth the risk. So you know, the, the stigma is justified. It is sad. It's, it's not good to see um, how people sort of lose their minds around coronavirus. I mean, the reality is it's a virus like any other. It's... Um, in terms of the seasonal sort of uh, winter type viruses, which include influenza and the, the coronavirus family, uh, works in pretty much the same way. So the way it infects people and the, the time course of the symptoms and that kind of thing, all very, very similar. 
Um, you know, so but we're not scared of those, but we're scared of this, this new, this new invader, this new intruder. I think with time, we'll probably just get used to it and just becomes a, a part of the portfolio. Um, I'll use a simple example, H1N1 from 2009, the good old fashioned swine flu that everyone freaked out about. And if you go back to hundred years ago, the, the, the Spanish flu, that flu epidemic, those particular viral strains just have just become normal. Um, everybody catches them and they've just joined the, 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 the millions of viruses we all catch every single year and develop immunity to. Um, so like I said, the, the issue right now is new, it's novel, we don't know what it does to people, we don't know what it does to individuals. Um, I think once you've had it once, then you know, because you get it the first time and it causes massive um, issues and complications, then you're probably going to have those complications going forward if you catch it again. And if you get it the first time and you're pretty much asymptomatic, then you're probably going to remain pretty much asymptomatic every time you get it. Um, and the immunity builds up very, very slowly. And I think to realize is the immunity doesn't last, doesn't look like it lasts. They're you know, very, very similar to all other coronaviruses. You get about two or three months of immunity from an infection. And um, this virus is widespread. It's a very simple virus. It mutates very, very quickly. So it keeps on producing new strains. You have to keep catching it to sort of keep your antivirus going. So excuse the pun from the computers, but that's exactly what you're dealing with. Got to keep uh, updating the antivirus so that you have the latest protection. And that's how it works in the viral world. You know, vac vaccines are commonplace. They are out there for, for many, many conditions. Um, but I just don't see there being a very effective coronavirus vaccine. I don't think it will be necessary in the future once it becomes sort of assimilated into the, new, the normal human viral load. We just develop immunity. The sad part is right now, there are many people who don't have the immune system to cope with it at the moment. And that's why we're seeing these complications. Okay, Zach, let's just finish with two timelines. So you start showing symptoms, maybe you get a little bit sick. Um, you don't show the major symptoms, you just get a few headaches on here, a lot of people get. Um, maybe, you know, a little bit of uh, the taste goes off, just minor symptoms, but you don't progress to a point where you've got what feels like a full-blown flu. How long do you wait? And then how do you start um, from general physiological practices, um, training again, implementing? Would it be your normal sort of practice, two weeks or so? and then start picking up slowly? Well, I think, yeah, very, very sim symptom-based. So if you haven't had a test done, um, or even if, if you have a negative result, so you, you think you've got COVID and you don't have COVID, it just turns out to be another bug. And like I said, there are so many bugs floating around at the moment, um, you know, because it is winter in South Africa. But the, 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 what you need to do is, is need to evaluate your symptoms. So my, my general rule is three days symptom-free to start. So you start counting the days. You wake up in the morning, you feel good today, you've got no headache, got no massive effusion in the head, you've got no lung problems, you can take, take deep breaths and there's, there's no real issues. That's day one. Get another two days of those in a row. Then you can start thinking about introducing some very, very light training, which means you don't just nip off into your quick comrade's uh, training session that you missed last week. <laughs> got to start at the basics. It might be a walk around the block, might be a little bit of time on the exercise bike, uh, 15, 20 minutes, see what happens. So start sort of experimenting with yourself, but keep everything very, very, very low. And if, if you progress without any issues, then you take a little bit further each day. That's all you really got to do. And I think from the medical point of view with, with coronavirus, you're probably also looking at getting a negative test result. So when you test negative, it would be the most stringent level. Is get a negative test result, wait two or three days, and then start thinking about picking up training at a very, very low level. If you have any doubt whatsoever, then seek some medical assistance or professional assistance to, to, to guide you along the way. You know, comrades cancelled, most of the events cancelled for the year in South Africa. So you've got the time. You know, you don't have to get out of there and go crazy again. You will recover. The events will be there next year. Um, and then you can focus on it. So stay safe, stay healthy, and think about others as well as yourself.